Hey everybody, it's Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And today I'm going to talk to you about a topic that's probably coming up in your organic chemistry lab soon, which is melting points. And the specifically we're going to talk today about the depression of melting points. So to do that, we're going to discuss the phase behavior of a typical binary solid. And by binary solid, I mean a mixture of two compounds that are blended together really closely at the molecular level. So the question that we ask ourselves first about this kind of a system is, why is it that melting points of most crystalline solids are highest when those substances are pure? And another way of stating the same question would be, why are melting points depressed in impure solids? So to answer that question, we're going to have to first characterize the behavior of a typical binary crystalline mixture. So let's do that now. Now what I've shown you here is a typical binary phase diagram. It's very idealized. It's relatively simplified. They usually look much more complicated than this, but I've distilled this down to the most important phase boundaries and the most important features for us to understand this melting point depression. So let's take a look at how I created this diagram. Now you'll notice that Unlike the phase diagram for pure substance, I have an axis for composition rather than an axis for pressure. So on my horizontal axis, I'm plotting the mole percentage of one compound and the other. In this case, green squares and red triangles. So if I start over here at 100 mole percent squares, whatever they may be, I expect that material when it's pure to have a certain melting point. Now that melting point is a single distinct temperature. Below that temperature, I have a solid. Above that temperature, I always expect to have a liquid. And of course, at that temperature, I can have an equilibrium of those two phases. But as I begin to add a little bit of the other compound, I notice that the phase boundary begins to go down in temperature. In other words, it takes less energy to melt a solid which is impure. So in this case, if I were to heat the solid at, let's say, this composition, I would expect it first to go through a range of melting temperatures, and we'll talk more about that in another video. But what's important right now is to notice that that entire transition takes place at a temperature which is lower than the melting point of the pure solid. So over this region, we've got a situation where our red compound is acting as an impurity in the green. Now at some point we reach something called the eutectic point, which is the lowest possible melting point for a mixture of these two substances, and also the only temperature at which a mixture of the two will melt at one specific temperature. After this point, my diagram starts to head back up toward the melting point of our red compound. And again, this is presumably because the green compound is now acting as the impurity because it's present in smaller amounts. And it's worth noting at this point that the eutectic point in this diagram appears to be right around the middle at about 50%, but that's not always the case. And so finally, I reached my melting point of my pure red compound. And again, I have a single temperature at which that composition can have solid and liquid coexisting in equilibrium. So the feature we're talking about today is the fact that the highest points on this entire phase diagram are those temperatures that correspond to the melting points of my pure substances. So why is it that adding a little bit of something else seems to always bring that melting point down? Now to answer this question, I'm going to have to buck my trend a little bit. I typically like to use things like squares, triangles, circles, colors to show how molecules behave. Uh, to try to get you to look at the big picture. But when it comes to melting point depression, we're going to have to look at the molecules one at a time to really understand why it happens. So let's think about a crystal of a compound called benzamide. As you can see at the bottom of your screen here, we have what looks like the surface of a growing crystal. And you notice that the benzamide molecules are all arranged in a very normal repeating pattern with very specific orientations. And if I were to allow this crystal to continue to grow under conditions that favor the most stable crystal, I would expect to have that pattern continue. 
So now that we have a larger representation, you can clearly see the relative orientations and positions are all repeating. This means that I'll have a very well-established network of hydrogen bonds and van der Waals forces holding this molecule or this crystal of molecules together. So in order to break this crystal down, in order to melt it and overcome the forces holding it together, it's going to take a great deal of energy. Because I've optimized the intermolecular attractions by having the same molecule in repeating positions again and again and again. When we have these optimized interactions, we get a strong crystal with a high melting point. So to overcome all these forces, I can apply a little bit of temperature to give these molecules some energy. But in our representation here, that's not an adequate amount of energy to overcome all those forces holding the crystal together. And so I have to add a little more. So let's increase the temperature some more. And eventually we reach the point where we do overcome those forces. Now, the molecule doesn't explode, like my representation here, but what does happen is that those molecules have an opportunity to move freely now within the sample. And so the forces have been overcome, the sample has been melted. So now let's consider the effect of an impurity on the melting point of my compound, or of this particular crystal. So we're going to rebuild that crystal of benzamide, but this time, I'm going to take that nice, beautiful network of optimized intermolecular attractions and I'm going to screw it up. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to change the identity of some of these molecules from benzamide to a similar compound, benzaldehyde. Now when I do this, notice that benzaldehyde doesn't have the NH2 group necessary to form some of the hydrogen bonds that stabilize the crystal. So these particular hydrogen bonds are going to be gone. They won't be present. So the presence of my benzaldehyde impurity has decreased the total number of and intensity of intermolecular attractions holding that bulk crystal together. Those missing intermolecular attractions translate to a weaker crystal. And a weaker crystal means it takes less thermal energy to overcome the forces holding it together. So in this case, I only need to heat my sample a small amount to get enough energy into those molecules to overcome all the forces holding them together. My sample has melted at a lower temperature. This is, in general, the way that impurities lead to melting point depression in organic crystalline materials. That's all for now. I'll see you guys next time. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other features we saw in our phase diagram. Don't forget to stop by chemistrygiftshop.com sometime and take a look around. A portion of all the proceeds go to convincing my wife to let me keep making these videos. Thanks everybody.